we're on? Okay, we've got Rona on the camera again. The last couple times we've tried to do this, it's been a debacle. Um, we have an infamous video where Rona was sniffing through the whole thing. So we haven't posted that yet. Yeah, I'm calling you out. Um, <clears throat> and then we have one that took us about 30 takes to get. So anyway, I'm in my garage right now. It's a little bit warmer today, but I've had several people asking me about what substrate I use for my moisture-dependent tarantulas. Um, just right off the bat, there are a lot of things out there that people use that are perfectly appropriate. I've recently heard on the boards people arguing that cocoa fiber isn't good for tarantulas, and the argument is that no tarantulas actually live on cocoa fiber. Cocoa fiber is a perfectly fine substrate. I've used it for quite a while. My biggest issue with it is that it dries up very, very quickly, and if you buy the bars and try to rehydrate it, and you're using it for an arid species, then what ends up happening is you have to like bake it in the oven to kind of prepare it. And I get a lot of keepers that end up hydrating it, leave it wet, put it in there for the arid species and end up having to pull them back out and dry it back out. Um, I've played around a lot with mixtures with mine. Now I want to make this very, very clear. This is just what I do and not necessarily the correct way to do it. This isn't the only way to do it. There are a lot of people that use a lot of different substrates. There are people that use just topsoil, which is perfectly fine. And I've used that in some enclosures. There are people that use just the cocoa fiber, and there's people that use just peat and a combination thereof. And what I use for my teas that need a little more moisture is a combination. So what I'm gonna do as a car drives by is put on some gloves. Hopefully the mailman doesn't stop here. Oh, no teas today. Because if my neighbors and mailman don't think I'm weird enough, now we're out filming in the garage while people are driving by. So I am putting on gloves when I do this because if anybody's ever seen my videos, I tend to bite my hands. So I have little cuts all over them and I don't feel like catching something from the dirt. So what we have here is the stuff I usually use. So how much pan down. Now understand that if you've only got a couple tarantulas, it's probably not going to make sense to buy all this stuff. I have now well over 100, so I keep the stuff on hand. But I believe this is the one that we get from Lowe's. It's just a regular old topsoil. And this is the one I believe from Home Depot or vice versa. If you go, they, both of these are great and they cost about a buck fifty each. I always have vermiculite. Um, when I first got into the hobby, everybody kept everything on vermiculite. Now I use it because it helps moisture wick through some of this stuff. And one of the reasons I started mixing is because when I got into the moisture dependent tarantulas, when I would pour water in the enclosures, some of the stuff wouldn't allow the water to absorb, it would just sit on top, which was kind of irritating. And the peat moss, I believe you get this big bale for 10 bucks. So again, 10 bucks, dollar fifty, and this bag or the uh, vermiculite is usually about five bucks. So very, very inexpensive. You can mix up a lot of enclosures. And basically what I do is I have a big bucket that I mix it all up in. This already has some peat and cocoa fiber in it from the older one, some of the topsoil. And I just mix the stuff all up. So very, very simple. <clears throat> Put some of this in here. Keep in mind the peat is usually very dry and very dusty. So if you're doing this, you don't want to wear your nice clothes. And usually about eh, 40 to 50% each. Mix it up, and then I add in the mericulite. And again, this is something, this is what I do. I found I have a lot of moisture dependent species now, whether it be the H. Lividium, lividums, um, the velocipes. Um, this is going to be for a stormy enclosure. I find it necessary to create something that basically allows the moisture to soak in more easily so it just doesn't puddle on the top. A little more in. There goes the mailman. Nothing for me today. And then what you do, and this is what causes a lot of people some grief, is when I add the water, I have my bottle that I use to add water to the enclosures. I spray it all down and mix it all up. And what I want is something ideally will hold its shape, but I can't squeeze water out of it. So that's the key. You don't want this stuff sopping wet. You don't want mud. You want something that's just nice and moist. And when you mold it, it goes together. And that's, I think, where a lot of people kind of freak out is they either add too much water and it's a swamp, or they don't add enough. Right here, mixing it up. And again, you can see there's dust still coming out of it, so there's still some, but that probably needs a little bit more there. Rowan's trying desperately to do his Darth Vader impersonation by breathing out of his mouth so he doesn't sniff, which is good. <clears throat> Yeah, see, that's a nice consistency there. And again, usually it's about 40 40% 40 of the topsoil right here. And I like this stuff because it comes usually a little bit moist and it's got a little bit of clay in it, which gives it a nice kind of sandy consistency. So I mix it with the peat, which is a little, you see a little bit fluffier there, a little more like the consistency of cocoa fiber. And I throw in the vermiculite and I kind of play it by ear. I'm gonna add a little bit more. Yeah. 
yeah see that's a nice nice consistency and then i'll go ahead i have my enclosure ready right oh, right here then it's just a matter of packing it in actually for this one i'm going to do something i'll do on some of them a little layer of vermiculite on the bottom and what this allows is when i pour water in the water tends to collect in the bottom it keeps the lower levels nice and moist and then it allows the moisture to kind of slowly evaporate and I do have another video coming where I show how I make it rain in my enclosures and what will happen is the water will run down the side and this will kind of help maintain the moisture on the lower levels a bit and then we're just gonna pack this stuff in now again I've seen people argue you know all you need to do is throw in straight uh, topsoil or straight peat and that's true there's no you don't have to go through all this but i've spent a lot of time kind of experimenting with this stuff and i found quite frankly that this way allows me to maintain the correct level of moisture in these enclosures come on man you can do it don't stay allows me to maintain the correct level of moistures in the enclosures and allows me that when i make it rain and the water goes in it doesn't just all puddle up on the top so again, you want to pack this down. <clears throat> there we go. And I'll probably go ahead and make it rain again. So come up here. My new little table. Are you going to be able to do it? You can pull it together. Roman doesn't know how to blow his nose yet. Yes, I do. 13 years old. He can't blow his nose. It's okay. Nobody's okay. touching you. So I am going to give this one a high, but I will say that my Sturmies, when I get a certain age, and this is going to be for what looks like I'm going to sex the molt, but I'm pretty positive it's a male. The last one looked male. A little cave. Notice this is holding its shape. And then for water dish, a lot of times I use just the souffle cups for these guys. Want a little bit more in here, something a little sturdier. So it's gonna get now I got dirt all in my hands, I'm gonna take my gloves off. These ones I get at Peco when they have their sales. I think I got them for 40% off, so I think they were actually less than a dollar each, and they're fantastic. And then I like to add a little bit of sphagnum around, which helps maintain some moisture. So I usually just spread it around to get the look at this long fiber sphagnum moss. And this is why it helps kind of maintain some of the humidity in it. I'm going to put these right over here. And that was pretty much set up. So I will do a rehousing video with this Sturmy afterwards. Hopefully it goes well. I've been having a lot of luck with my Sturmy's not kicking hairs. Yeah, you're almost done, bud. Um, so what I will do is, once again, before I put the Sturmy in, I will take my watering thing and kind of go over and add a little bit more. But this is nice and moist, perfect for it. Um, the enclosure it's in now is a little bit smaller, but it has the same substrate mix, and I've had no problems with mold or anything else. And again, one thing to make very, very clear, make sure, if you look here, there's a lot of ventilation. I put it on all four sides, a little less on the longer side. Some of them I've put a little more on, but you do want good ventilation going through here. So that would be how I would set up an enclosure for a moisture-dependent species. Again, it's like 40% 40, 40 or so peat, 40% topsoil. I throw in some of the vermiculite, and again, it's not necessarily the correct way to do it, meaning that my way is not the only way to do it. There's people that use a lot of different stuff, and there's people that never mix any substrate. I just found this works very, very well for me, and I've had some people ask what I use in my enclosures. And I've had a lot of luck with being able to keep the humidity or the moisture levels up and not having it um, grow mold. So here we go. I will add afterwards the rehousing to the end of this video so you can see him try to get his new home.